Jubilee, please hear these words. Who will find peace with the lands? The future of humankind lies waiting for those who come to understand their lives and take up their responsibilities to all living things. Who listens to the trees, the animals, and the birds, and the places of the land? As the long forgotten peoples of the respective continents rise and begin to reclaim their ancient heritage, they will discover the meaning of the lands there of their ancestors. That is when the invaders of the North American continent will finally discover that for this land, God is red. By Bind Deloria. From Winona, Winona Leduc, a Green Party president, vice presidential candidate also a Native American woman. Across the continent, on the shores of small tributaries, in the shadows of the sacred mountains, in the vast expanse of the prairies, or the safety of the woods, prayers are being repeated, and they have for thousands of years, and common people with uncommon courage and whispers of their ancestors in their ears continue their struggles to protect the land and water and the trees on which their very lives and existence is based, and like small tributaries joining together to form a mighty river, their force and powers grow. This is ancient wisdom and holy word. Thanks be to all that is wise and holy. All creation is wisdom and holy word. All creation sings wisdom in God. Hallelujah. Jubilee, I would like to welcome you this morning into a moment in my life and a really, really deep gratitude to be able to share in this time. In our ceremonies that we do, we in our sweat lodge ceremonies, in the middle of the sweat lodge, the sweat lodge itself represents the womb of Mother Earth. Whenever we build the sweat lodge, we build the sweat lodge out of 16 ribs. The 16 ribs that protect, protect the womb of the mother whenever the child is being born. So we take the ribs and we bend them. And we bend them gently and we sing to them and we pray to them as we bend them. As we begin to create the womb of Mother Earth. And when all 16 of the lodge poles and the ribs are tied together, right over the middle of the pit is formed an eight-point star. And to my people, we come from the stars. So this is the central point. And within the sweat lodge is a pit. And inside that pit represents the belly button of Mother Earth, the umbilical connection back to the mother. So whenever we re-enter re back into the womb, we are reconnecting with life. And on the outside where we have the fire pit with the stone people, we put the stone people in there and get the stones hot. The stone people come from the very beginning of time. They come from that molten lava that is the heart, heart blood and the life blood of life that started way down deep in the very heart of Mother Earth and was that liquid fire. And when all the living beings of the skies and the star beings came to the earth, Mother, heart, Mother Earth's heart was filled with so much joy that she exploded and it formed the earth. And the stone people, from the very beginning of time, carried the vibration of every story, song, tear, laughter from the very beginning of time. And the vibration lives inside those stone people. So whenever we reheat the stones, it's like taking them back home so they can remember we take them back so we can remember. And then we ask the stone people, we, we take them and we bring them. We bring them into the lodge and we put them inside the pit, the belly button of Mother Earth, to warm that connection, to rewarm that warmth of love and compassion and honor and acceptance. That place where maybe we don't even have a memory, we just know that we were cuddled in warmth and safety of our mother. When we return to the lodge and whenever we close the door and the darkness comes and the only light is the light of the smiles of the ancestor stone people. And then whenever we take the water and we add the water to the stones and we hear that hissing sound, 
to our people, that's the voice of the ancestors. That's the voice of the ancient ones. I don't know about you, but in my way of education, they always taught us that the four elements of life, the water, the earth, the air, and the fire. In this ceremony, whenever we come back into the womb, all four of these elements of life are combined. And whenever the steam rises up from the stones and we breathe it, to us, that's the combination of all living elements so we get to breathe the essence of life. It's the essence of life that goes in and it fills us up and it, it goes in and we ask it to purge those vibrations in our bodies that no longer serve the higher good. And we sweat. We purge those toxins where they're physical toxins of things that we've eaten or ingested, whether physically or spiritually. The things that we hear on the news. If red meat stays in your body for 30 years, how long does bad news stay in your spirit? How long does trauma live within the vibration of your soul? In this time of Native American history, my, as far as I know, that's as far as I can go back in our histories. That's as far as I can go as whenever the stars came to the earth. Not much is written about that time. Much of what we remember from that time lives inside of us. Lives inside these tiny little recorders that we were given long before Sony or Texas Instruments ever came along. <laughs> these little memory chips that we have. They were given to us that were formed. They were formed by the creation of the coming together of all things. These crystal people, these stone people, whether they're in solid form or in water form, these are gifts to us. And it's through this, through this medium that we try our best because the Creator has given us the ability to create the water that is the tears of happiness. As you walk through life, what is it that brings tears to you? Have there been times where you just laugh so hard and you just can't help and it just tears come out and it's just so funny? And there's just something ancient with inside of that. Or maybe you can just be looking out the window and see something happen on the street to someone and it'll bring a tear, a memory. In this way, we know we're connected to all living things. We're able to share the tears that the rain people, when we see the cloud people come, and whenever we call for the earth to receive nourishment and water so that the crops might grow or there may not be a drought, nature comes and shows us how to shed these tears in a good way. The cloud people come and they shed the rain, and the rain fall like tears on the earth to give it relief. So in this time of remembering those that have come before, maybe we have tears of sadness. Maybe we have tears of memories of this happiness. And perhaps we just have a memory of being. Here in this time in Asheville, I grew up over across the mountain from here. Whenever I was a small boy, my auntie, her name is Molly Running Wolf, old Indian woman. She used to always wear a long dress, lost cloth dress that was made out of an old apple, uh, a flower sack. And they would take the flower sacks and they'd sew them together and they'd make dresses. And she always wore these old sensible nylons with these old sensible shoes. <laughs> and always had a red bandana. My father was one of those people that whenever someone was getting ready to cross over, people would come to ask my father to help them cross over. Not in the church way, but in our traditional Cherokee way. We were at the home playing at Molly Running Wilson one morning, and we heard a car coming up the road, and 
I looked and I saw the car and I knew it was going to be a little bit because the road went this way up the side of the mountain and finally made its way over here to Molly's house. And by the time they got there, we knew that there was an old man in the community that was about to pass away. And we knew the car, so we knew that the, the young woman must be coming to tell my dad that her father had passed. And there were people gathered at, at Molly's house, and we were still not quite sure why, but they would all hang out in her backyard because she was a medicine woman. She would fix the medicines and the teachers, you might call them. And people would come and sit in her backyard around this big fire, and they would wait for her, and she'd come out and hand them whatever it was that they needed for their health. And whenever this woman showed up to report the death of her father, all the people came together, and they got together in their cars and their trucks, and everybody went down the mountain. And in those days, I mean, it wasn't like today where you had interstates and everything. It was the back roads. So it took probably from Molly's house down the road, around the valley, across the river, up the other side of the mountain to the other house, about 15 minutes in a truck. So as we were leaving, everybody had left, and it was just my father, myself, and my Aunt Molly. And I looked at Aunt Molly and said, Come on, come on, Auntie, we have to go. And she just sat there at that kitchen table with a cup of coffee and just nodded at me. And my dad touched me on the arm. My dad and I got in the truck with Aunt Molly sitting in the kitchen with her coffee. We drove down the mountain. We drove, we went down the road and went over the river and across the dell and through the woods and we got to the other house and we walked in. There was Molly sitting at the kitchen table with her cup of coffee. We talk about going into the mystic. Whenever I hear mystery, whenever I hear mystic, when I hear stories like that, it's not so mystical. Because I grew up in these mountains. I grew up in a culture where these things were common. Where it wasn't, we were so accepting and in tune of what was being presented to us. Knowing that there were stories out there somewhere if we listened enough. Some people would say, oh, the old ones that knew those stories are long gone. No, they're not, my grandfather would always say. You see that apple tree right there? I bet it remembers. How about that oak tree over there? I'm pretty sure he remembers quite a bit. Perhaps we should go ask these people what their memories are. And that's when I began to learn that you could pick up a stone. And just ask, who are you? What do you know? Tell me a story. How many of us have ever taken the time just to hold something and just listen? Listen for a story. And whether it's the stone that tells the story or maybe it's the stone that it's the weight that triggers something inside our spiritual memory. Maybe it's like mashing a button. Have you ever heard the saying something, somebody's really good at pushing your buttons and it evokes some kind of emotion from you? Maybe it's these kind of triggers that push those buttons for us. Not to annoy us, but to reel. Maybe as each stone comes and we ask each one, maybe it's just the gesture of holding it that gets the story to being told. People talk about UFOs. Man, you talk about mysterious. Whenever I was 12 years old, My father gave me a brand new 22 rifle. He couldn't tell me anything. <laughs> the only thing about my birthday and getting this 22 rifle was it was the first day of school. So the first day of school, I had my brand new 22 rifle, and I'm thinking, I really want to go up in the woods and shoot. I don't want to go hunting. I just want to go shoot my rifle. So in my 12-year-old mind, I figure out a way to do this. 
I leave my bedroom, my bedroom window unlocked, and I take my rifle and I put it up against the window with my box of shells. I grab my books and I walk out to the bus stop. And when the bus stop, when the bus comes, I go hide in the bushes. <laughs> Whenever the bus left, I came out of the bushes and I went over to the house and I slid open my bedroom window. And I grabbed my rifle and I grabbed my shells and I started to make my way up the mountain. Now, right where I grew up over in Cherokee, there's a river behind our house, Soco Creek. I call it a river because as a kid, it was a river, but as it got bigger, it got smaller, so it became a creek. <laughs> the trail from our house would cross that river or cross a little bridge, and the trail went up to this old man's house. The old man, named, his name was Louisine Thompson. He was an old, old man. Only had one leg. Had one of those kind of like tree stump crutches, not the hospital types, but just like, wow, this piece of wood looks like it'll work. And he had a crutch like that, but he only, he didn't have a left leg. So that trail went right through his front yard and around the back, through his backyard, and then it went up the mountain, old logging trail. So I'm traipsing along with my gun, and I come up to his front porch, and he's sitting on his front porch, and he looks at me, and he he said, today is not a good day to go up on the mountain. He said, you should turn around and go home. He saw that look on my face, and he said it again, more stern. Go home. So I turned around, went back down the trail. Instead of going home, I cut down the river a little ways, and then I cut up the mountain through the thick. Because I was going up on the mountain shooting my rifle. As I came up on the trail, I finally came up on the trail that I wanted to be. And right up there, about midway through the mountain, there was this clearing area up there where my, my mother and my elders used to always say that that's where the little people, the, the spirits of the mountains, the, the children's spirits that watch over these mountains, they would come and do ceremony. And that's why no grass or any vegetation would glow, grow on that area because at nighttime, whenever the moon would come out, the little people would come and dance and celebrate. So we were always reverent about this. Whenever, as, even as kids, we'd walk around it. Just We knew that was like grandma was in there taking a nap, and you didn't bother grandma. So we're walking around, and I just felt something. And the wind picked up. And I looked across the clearing, and standing over there by the tree was that old man leaning on his crutch. And he told me again in Cherokee, Yona, go home. I told you, today is not a good day to be up here. Go home. Now, 12 years old, whenever I ran, there used to be deer that would line up to watch me run because I ran so fast. <laughs> Buddy, I ran down that mountain, down that trail. I didn't care if anybody saw me. I ran down through his backyard and went around to the front of this house. And when I got to his front porch, he was sitting on his front porch laughing. <laughs> and he said, sit down. He said, in two days, I'm going home. And my people are up here on the mountain preparing my journey. So today is not a good day, Yona, to go on the mountain. He said, you go home and you tell your dad that in two days, my friends are coming to get me. Don't know what that means. I'll do that, but you know what that means? I have to admit that I didn't go to school today. <laughs> if I tell the truth here, it's going to lead to more questions. <laughs> so whenever I got back to the house, my mom already knew, mom being mom. I walked in the door, she feared as much. Matter of fact, she's my, actually been the one that left my bedroom window open. <laughs> so whenever my dad came home I told him and you could tell he was agitated a little bit but even more so this is one of the first times in my life where I felt compassion in my father's heart or maybe it's the first time I ever actually looked for it or wanted it So two days later, my father comes home from work. 
we all sit down and eat dinner like we always do. Around 4.35, 4.40, right when my dad got home from work, that's when we ate. And right after dinner, my dad, get in the truck. So we got in the truck and like I said, the old man's house was up on the mountain behind our house in Soco Valley there. My dad got me in the truck and we drove across the valley to the opposite side of the mountain where there's an old family cemetery about the same level as the old man's house. And we sat there. It got dark, started to get dusky dark, that purplish kind of color. Now remember folks, I grew up on this mountain. I know every trail a man and woman can go down. I know every animal trail. I know every path up and down that mountain. It started getting dark and I saw these two lights bouncing. It looked like maybe it might have been two men hunting, carrying lanterns. They might have been coon hunters because that's about the time of night they'd start coming out. So I kind of figured maybe it's two hunters getting ready to go out to do some night hunting. And as I sat there, all of a sudden, these two lights just dropped. And I was so startled, I looked at my dad, and my dad was already looking at me like just, shh, watch it. Because I know there's no trail, there's no way that anyone, without short of falling to your death, could ever perform that. At the, each end of Luzine Thompson's house was a chimney. And these lights came down the mountain. And they bounced along. And whenever they came to Luzine's house, the two lights went up and disappeared into the chimney. And I looked at my dad, and without saying anything, he just gave me that look like, keep watching. And my 12-year-old mind didn't have a watch or anything. It might have been half a minute, maybe a minute. But at the other chimney, three lights came out. And these three lights started going up that very trail I was telling you about that led up to that ceremonial ground from Luzine's house. And those three lights, as my dad and I sat on the opposite side of the mountain watching these lights, when it got up to that clearing where the little people do their ceremonies, they stopped. It was almost as if they had stopped to say hello or to pay their respects. Then suddenly all three lights And I looked at Dad, and Dad just looked at me, smiled a little bit. Well, he's going home now. And that's all that was said. Luzine Thompson's body was never found. Nobody formed any search parties to look. It's just a way of life. When we start talking about Native American History Month and we start talking about the atrocities that happened to the peoples of this land, well, the peoples of this land have come to a point where we say prayers for the people that came, the settlers, the invaders, as Vine Deloria calls them. Because for the most part, what was done to us was done to them before they ever got here. Done to them by their own people in the name of religion. These mountains are covered with Irish ancestry. Where did they come from? Their difference is over religion. Where did almost anyone else come from? As Jay was saying, we're all indigenous. We are all one indigenous tribe of this earth. And as we come back into ceremony, as we come back into sacred space, and as we center ourselves, whether we go into the future in a clockwise motion to move forward, or whether we go back and remember, let's remember that we call upon this energy. In this time where all the resources of Mother Earth are being drained. And thank you, Brian, for that song of the adaptation. Because our mother is sensitive. And if we keep taking and taken and taken without giving back. 
This is all that's going to be left. It's a place to pray for what once was. So maybe we can just draw a blank on blank, blank history month. How about indigenous people's memory of life? Not just a month, not just a day, but with each and every breath. How can we restore that, that we know? How can we bring back the old ways? How do we create new ways for the old way? We know it's there, don't we? Maybe we don't know all the answers, but can we at least offer the best of what we have or what we do know? And this, we're moving into the mystic. Isn't it better to not know and learn than to think you know and go try to imply that on what comes next? Hasn't that been going on for too long? Will we be having all these holidays and these memory days, these memorials, whenever every life can be, every day can be a celebration of those memories? What is your history? In this time, whenever we're talking about what is our history, Native Month, let's not even put American in it. Because there's a lot of people in my world that when you say American, man, you've already lost them in that conversation. Is there a kind word to say that includes all of us without anyone being offended? Can we really go back in history just like Jay was saying, before the human mind came along, before all these philosophers, before all of this idealism and separation, there was just the wind and the water and the grass and nature. And the sun came up and the grass knew what to do. The trees knew to grow. Something inside the plant life said, yes, yes, me, hit me, hit me, hit me. Grow to the light. And in some ancient way, isn't that what we all have inside of us? Whether we're a mushroom or a root, whether we're a tree or a rock or a salamander, a duckbill platypus, and you can't tell me the creator doesn't have a sense of humor by looking at the <laughs> duckbill platypus. But the beautiful thing about duckbill platypus is they have no natural predators. And just be yourself. Like our, our friend Bennett here once said, you know, hey, let's all take a walk on the wild side because everybody's invited. Take a walk on the wild side of life. That wild side that is nature. That wild side that is that very primal instinct that we all have to grow toward the light. At least I do. Do you have it in you to grow toward the light? Little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. That's not a traditional Cherokee song, but we sing it. <laughs> and we sing the other songs that talk about the light, that talk about the warmth. Whenever we call the directions and we look to the east and we call the beings of the sun nation and the light nation to come to us. And we join that with the effort to look to the south to honor the people and the, all the beings of the water nations. And then we look to the west, and we ask those ancestors of all those that have come before, and even of the memories of those to come, to be with us in this time. And then when we look to the north and invite the wind to take all of this and stir it and mix it together, just like whenever we take the water and pour it on top of them rocks, and it begins to offer this that sacred breath, that very sacred breath that when we inhale it, it goes inside our body. It's like taking a drink of water just knowing that you're going to quench your thirst. Breathe in that knowledge. Breathe in that knowledge so it can go in and purge out all of those things that don't serve your desire and journey to that path of knowledge. Any obstacles that might be in your way can we put aside the individual histories and the sad story and live one memory?
because that's how it started out. It's one vision for oneness in life. And that's why in our prayers we say for as long as the water flows and the grass grows and the wind blows, let us all be as one. Let us all be in harmony. This has been a nation for how long? A couple hundred years. In 500 years. Let this be the memory and the history that our children tell of how we as a people, as a community, came together to further the dream and love and honor and compassion of our ancestors. What did we do right now to create the history that will be told by our next generations? What will you do, Jubilee, right now to write your page in that history? Whether it's through a silent prayer, whether it's through donating to the hungry, whether it's donating to your community or your time or whatever it is. Just like we say in the sweat lodge whenever people are, oh, is it going to get hot? It's the sweat lodge. <laughs> 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 but we're not here to see how tough you are. We're not here to see how much you can take. But we are here to know what we're willing to give in order to receive the blessing of our prayer and our vision. So if you will, Jubilee, accept my thank you from not only myself, but from my people, the Cherokee, the people of this land, of these mountains, the mystery that comes with them, the new mystery that's going to come whenever we get over what we think we know. And I'll meet you there. And we'll start writing that history together in a good way. Because she is sensitive. It's like we are. Uh -oh. Uh -oh.